Good evening. My name is Betty Tonzing and welcome to the Indiana Council of World Affairs. And this is, we're off and running with our Great Decisions uh, 2023 Carl Gaywater Great Decisions Program. And this evening's program is on the climate. And the and for many of you who have our journal that comes with uh, this, that's put out by the Foreign Policy Association, I believe the topic was specific to be climate migration. And we will talk a bit about climate migration tonight, but I saw a wonderful opportunity for doing something that I, I that was different and I was driven to do. Uh, I remember um, looking closely at the global summit that took place a couple of years ago uh, in Glasgow, and they had made such a big deal about inviting uh, youth activists this time to the table, more than just saying, well, just come and here's an invitation, but to the table. And that suggested that there was going to be room at the table for them to actually engage and participate and be listened to. And uh, it was uh, I was interested in reading some of the stories about how it's very expensive to attend these things. And a lot of the youth had found themselves finding what rooms they could and with each other an hour out while all the people who came with their expense accounts were staying in Glasgow and, of course, got all the essential time in the evening where people are going to the dinner and the bar and really having the real discussions. And, and they thought, well, when we get to the conference, we'll see what kind of a table we're going to be at. And they found that there was still just an awful lot more of head padding. Oh, you are so inspiring. Oh, it's going to be so wonderful. And then some really carrying on with, with discussions of fossil fuels. And I thought, well, geez, why don't we, I, there are some impressive young people who have already demonstrated outstanding work in what they're doing. Uh, I was a student chair of the Earth Day activities for the very first one in 1970 with Indiana University. We're getting into university in 1970. And we really didn't know what we were doing at all. And uh, but it's not felt like a brave new world and very exciting. And you would have thought that in the last 52 years there might be some great changes. But these young people, they're they're professionals, they're committed and they're organized, and they do know what they're doing and they're outstanding. And so that is our program this evening. I'm very excited um, to, I will just very, very quickly present um Jay Cause is going to be our moderator this evening. And he is a PhD student. He joined us a couple of years ago when we had another uh, a panel very similar to this. And, and the people who were involved were so inspiring. And it just really brought tears to my, tears in my eyes, I thought. They really, let, let's, my feeling was, let them take over. Let them take over. We adults with a much shorter runway have made a bit of a hot mess of things and let these young professionals have at it. He is a PhD student in the School for the Environment and Sustainability at the University of Michigan and a member of the Urban Sustainability Research Group, studying the role of urban agriculture in a changing climate. Um, the panel this evening will be composed of Zanaji artist. He is from uh, Connecticut, a graduate of Brown University. Zanaji is a, uh, a co-founder and executive director of Zero Hour. I was always impressed with the work that they did. That's a climate justice organization. He's a co-author of a book, a kid's book about climate change and co-host of a podcast. His uh, Some of his articles on climate justice have appeared in the New York Times, Teen Folk, and The Economist. I'm telling you, these young, you want to listen to these young people. They know what they're doing. He's traveled to the Antarctica as an ambassador of the Global Choices Arctic Angels Network to introduce polar climate impacts firsthand. But joining us also is Bella Wash. She is a chemical engineer majoring at the University of uh, Michigan, where among other things, she is a Michigan Research and Discovery Scholar, recipient of several academic distinctions, and she worked under the Climate Law Institute as a for the group, California Law versus Big Oil. Joining us this evening was also going to be Serena Dressel, who is the coordinator of the Student Sustainability Center at Portland State University, uh, where she works with a number of other uh, uh, students uh, with an emphasis on global leadership and management, helping to lead the Portland Youth Climate Summit and the Greater Portland Sustainability Education Network. She unfortunately, though, woke up this morning very, very ill and try as she might, took a couple naps, just could not make it this evening, so we will miss her participation. And with that, I am now going to turn it over to Jake Hawes. Thank you, Betty. It is my absolute pleasure to be back with you folks. Uh, and I'm excited to talk with you about climate change, climate migration, and to hear about the really exciting ideas and work um, that our two panelists bring to the table. I do wanna take just a moment as we open, um, as you heard, 
Bella and I are both at the University of Michigan, um, and I'm guessing that a lot of folks in the room have connections to East Lansing or Lansing and Michigan State. So I want to acknowledge what happened there today um, and just say that our thoughts are with everyone who is connected to that community, uh, especially those affected by the shooting. Um, unfortunately, we are here today to talk about other heavy topics, but I think we'll bring some light and levity to it and hopefully keep you excited and interested and engaged with the conversation about climate change and hopefully leave you with some ideas on how we can, as a community and as a planet, start to address some of these really challenging issues. And that, I think, is one of the really exciting parts of what Betty has brought together here. We're bringing together folks who have ideas about how they and their groups um, and their communities can start to make a difference in what is going to be the defining challenge of the 21st century. Um, so I came to the climate action world through Purdue University, where I was an environmental engineer, and I found that I was really, really interested in the stuff that I was doing as an environmental engineer. I really liked some of the design uh, ideas that I was able to practice. But at the same time, that world couldn't answer for me all of the questions that I had about what was causing these great crises that we saw, about how we solved human challenges, and about how we could address things at a broader societal level. So I went on to do a, a master's degree in natural resources, social science, and eventually combined those two in what I'm doing now with climate change adaptation, urban ag. All of this is my way of trying to say that, you know, we have a lot of really exciting solutions out there. We know how to solve some of these problems. And now we got to figure out how to implement that. And so that's what I, my work is about and what I'm hoping to bring to the table. Before we get started with any kind of content related questions, I'd like to hear from our panelists about what brought them to the table and what they're really excited about um, in their groups and in their work. So we're going to start with Bella Wash. Um, Bella, can you tell us a little bit about what brought you to this work and what inspired you to get involved? And then, of course, what keeps you moving forward? So, yeah, hopefully you guys can hear me. It's great to speak to you all today. Um, again, I'm currently at the University of Michigan. My condolences to University of Michigan. My condolences to anyone and everyone affected in this horrible, horrible issue we have going on in this country. But originally, I'm from California growing up in Southern California on the west side of Los Angeles. So the beach and the waters and nature was something that was always very, very special to me and very important to me. I grew up going to the beach. And as I started to get to high school age, I saw the rapid effects of plastic pollution and general pollution and the fact that people who were younger and people who were 10 years younger than me didn't get to experience the same beach as I did was something that really crushed my soul. So I first got into my activism with a local nonprofit um, in LA called Heal the Bay. Their main focus was making sure that there was clean water and watersheds for a bunch of different groups that started with me working beach cleanups, later becoming a beach captain with them, working in their aquarium, and really getting involved in not only plastic pollution, but pollution and climate change as a whole. Um, from there, I started working with the Sunrise Movement. Um, if you guys aren't familiar, the Sunrise Movement is a national organization um, that kind of promotes climate revolution um, for younger people. And particularly when I joined, they were supporting the Green New Deal, which was this large climate bill brought um, up by AOC, which is something that we were really trying to champion. Um, from then, I got involved with the LA chapter, with the LA youth chapter, supporting a lot of the organization that they were doing and seeing not only how I can volunteer, but how I can empower others to volunteer and get involved, which is kind of what took me outside of just climate support to climate activism. Um, and then from there, I became a youth fellow, um, as Betty mentioned, with um, the Center for Biological Diversity, specifically supporting climate law and a group called California Youth versus Big Oil, which really was against a lot of the oil fields um, and things that were going on and a lot of the shocking that was happening within California as a whole. So that's a little bit about my environmental activism background and I'd love to hear from Zanaji. Thanks, Bella. Zanaji, over to you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, yeah, I'm Zanaji. Um, I am now based in Utah, but I grew up in Connecticut and similar to Bella actually, uh, I got involved in environmental issues because of the ocean. So growing up on the coast, uh, I wanted to make a difference through plastic reduction. And I did that in my school. I did that with my family and doing recycling and doing beach cleanups. 
And eventually I saw that it wasn't having the kind of impact that I wanted to. We would go back to do cleanups and there would still be more plastic and it was just a never ending cycle. Um, and then I also got involved with Mystic Aquarium in Connecticut on wildlife conservation and save the manatees and, and all these efforts for wildlife, but um, started to realize that climate change is this really big issue that doesn't just affect wildlife, but it actually is such a human centered issue. And so when I met the other co-founders of Zero Hour um, in the summer of 2017, we decided that we wanted to take action together on a scale that would be more than just the community that we were in or the high school that we were in. And so we decided to lead the youth climate marches, um, which happened in July, 2018. And those were national actions, really just uh, calling attention to the fact that young people uh, are ready to mobilize on climate change and that it's an issue that we will inherit if action wasn't taken today. And so that's the gist of the name Zero Hour. We're out of time to take action and we're ready to mobilize. Fabulous. Thank you both so much. And I have to say, I find it um, pretty entertaining that uh, I also grew up on the coast. I grew up in Galveston, Texas on the Gulf Coast and three people who were, uh, I suppose you could say militarized by the view of the ocean um, have come together to talk to a lot of folks in Indiana. And, uh, you know, as you as you all can imagine, right, I've spent a lot of time in Indiana. My family's from Indiana. It's close to my heart. Um, but it is it's great to uh, talk with folks who who for whom the ocean holds such a special place. OK. So let's talk a little bit about climate change migration and some of the challenges that are associated with climate change. So a lot of you, I think, read the magazine article for this week, uh, and, and it's titled Climate Change, Environmental Degradation and Migration. And we're going to talk about that today, but we're also going to talk about some of the kind of broader questions related to activism, action, and climate change. Um, so I'm going to ask a question first for Bella, and this one this one will be kind of getting us started with some of the material that is close closely related to the journal article, and uh, hopefully will be familiar to folks. So, the article that we read for today really centers on socio political challenges related to climate migration, um, and by my reading of it, some scholars, both in the article and, and um, otherwise, have pointed out that recent wars in the Middle East have actually become seen and, and may later be seen more broadly as the first climate wars. The first displacement from, from Syria and neighboring countries, I think we can argue, may be seen as some of the first large-scale climate migration. The most recent United Nations Conference on Climate Change also brought the issues of climate migra migration and loss and damage, that's a key word, we can come back to that if people are interested, to the world stage. And ultimately, the conclusion here is that climate change is happening and anything that we do uh, today may avoid its worst effects, but it will not prevent damage and displacement. So migration and damage are going to become continuing issues. So Bella, my question for you, and this is a tricky one, but it'll start us off strong. I'm wondering, about, I'm wondering how you think about how climate adaptation and the work of groups like yours addresses these sorts of intersecting environmental and social crises. And beyond that, how can we simultaneously reconfigure a global economy built on carbon while also supporting those folks who are worst affected by things like climate migration? Yeah, definitely. It's a fantastic question. And I'll go through kind of what all of my groups did. And to be honest, all of my groups were working both socially and environmentally. And then I'll kind of tie it together with like a general larger, bigger theme that I've taken away from being a part of all of these different groups. So starting with Heal the Bay and kind of how do we get Los Angeles to look like a place where you can have clean water and also people can use that water and it's kind of an equitable space. Um, and the first thing that we started there was with advocating for a lot of these local bills, like planning plastic. I know as Naji mentioned, like plastic pollution is pretty much one of the key things that's keeping a lot of these waterways um, polluted. Um, so banning a lot of the plastic, I know, I don't know if you guys heard, but like California banned a lot of the plastic bags used in like grocery stores, um, single use plastics. Um, that was something that I worked heavily with for a really long time. So a lot of that was just going and showing up as someone young and as someone who cared at a lot of these smaller local meetings where no more than 20 or 30 people were coming and only a quarter of them were actually speaking and kind of making public comments. 
that was kind of some of the work that I knew I did for my community um, and hopefully set a precedent for a lot of the larger things that were happening within California. And then just moving through Sunrise, Sunrise's big thing at the time was the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal was this idea of we're going to move away from greenhouse gases. We're going to move away from a lot of the fossil fuels that we're working off of and start one moving towards clean energy, but also creating new jobs and creating new infrastructure for a lot of the people who needed that at the moment. So creating a space where not only we're moving towards clean energy, but socially, it's also creating productivity with our economy and within the spaces that a lot of these blue collar workers and that whole section of the blue collar field was kind of being diminished as a lot of the big oil companies were getting richer and making the 1% even more rich and leaving a lot of that kind of middle class blue collar section behind. So really empowering that while also empowering like environmental justice was a big thing and a big part of what I was doing with Sunrise. Um, and then moving on with California Youth versus Big Oil, like I mentioned, I was in the Climate Law Institute. So analyzing a lot of the different bills and things specifically around fracking and around oil and kind of how that was affecting other communities was one of the really big approaches that we took. Not only was fracking bad for the environment, but it was also terrible for the surrounding communities and their effects on the surrounding communities was one of the things I focused on because a lot of the surrounding communities were low income, were primarily people of color. So it wasn't that one inherently what these oil companies were doing were bad, but the effects were happening disproportionately with a lot of these communities. So making sure that social equity was there as well was kind of one of the bigger things when we were talking about how to support these different bills, these different legislations, um, and kind of supporting communities with that in tandem. Um, so I guess speaking up, if you guys can see the little common theme amongst all of the work that I did for all other people, a lot of it started with legislation and with policy, which is what I really loved about the Great Decisions article of how there was a whole section about the importance of policy. Like Zanaji mentioned, like a lot of these one-off things that Gen Zers start to do is, okay, we're gonna recycle, we're gonna compost, we're gonna go to these one-off different events. But in the end term, that's a Band-Aid that's not going to fix all the plastic that's out there. It's kind of going to the source and saying, okay, what bills are going on? What policies can we support? Where can we speak out at different public comments and using our own voice as citizens and as people who empower who we put into office was a really big thing that I took away as like a youth trying to figure out what my place was in the age of someone who was just coming into my age to vote and to start speaking and writing op-ed columns and things like that. So I guess to summarize it, the biggest way that my groups and personally myself want to both reconfigure us as an environment, but us as a social economy is thinking what different bills and legislations are out there? What policies out there and how can we support them? And also, what are they driven by? Are they driven, is this policy driven by an oil company trying to get more time and more resources? Or is this driven by a community that's being polluted and different people in their family and different people in their community are suddenly getting asthma and suddenly getting a lot of exposure to all these chemicals and things that aren't fair for them. So a lot of that social economy and that environmental economy is simply built on equity and a lot of the work that I did was within policy and kind of empowering people to think that they can vote and speak on a lot of these super important social and environmental issues. Perfect. Thank you, Bella. That's really interesting. It's great to hear your perspective on how these challenges cross over sort of disciplinary or sectoral borders. Um, and actually, I really appreciate the lens of equity that you're applying to all of this both, of course, because it's important, but also selfishly because it segues very nicely into my next question. Um, so I would like to hear a little bit from Zanaji. And this one really starts to think about these sort of intersectional and intersecting solutions and challenges that Bella spoke to. So when we think about the effects of climate change already happening, which we just talked about and which the journal article spoke to, we are very quickly confronted with the realities of inequality. Specifically, especially in this country, but also globally, communities of color are often on the front lines of climate change from sinking shorelines in Louisiana, which we read about in the article in the Isle de Jean Charles, right? That was actually an indigenous community that was on the front lines um, to the flood risk rising in Indian Ocean, small Indian states to uneven heat risk in Indianapolis, which there are lots of articles about and I'd be happy to talk about. 
The article folks read for today um, particularly raises this in the context of indigenous communities, which I mentioned, whose abilities to adapt to climate change have been systematically curtailed by centuries of settler colonialism and through continued efforts to expand fossil fuel infrastructure on their lands, which I know is an Aji, that's an issue that's close to your heart. Can you tell us about how your work has intersected with climate justice and the ways in which communities outside of high-risk areas can act in solidarity with these frontline folks? Yeah, thanks so much for that question. So Zero Hour is a youth-led climate justice organization. And so we center climate justice in all of the things that we do, but it's, it's difficult to say exactly what that means. But I think using the word justice is very intentional because for us in talking about climate justice, we're intentionally saying that there are people who have been wronged and, and that that is an injustice that needs to be rectified. And so, and framing it that way, we are positioning people who have been impacted by climate change as people who are experiencing injustice. And that has been a policy choice, has been a, a choice by corporations. Um, because we have known about climate change and global warming for, for decades now, and we had opportunities to take action. Um, in the past, we had climate science available and, and action was not taken. Um, and so some examples of that include uh, the people who exist on the front lines of the climate crisis, people with diverse identities, black people, indigenous people, people of color across the United States and around the world are living in the places that are being most impacted by the climate crisis, um, but also most directly impacted by the fossil fuel industry and uh, industrial animal agriculture, which are causing the climate crisis. And so these locations, um, people are living in some of the most polluted places in the country and in the world. Uh, and that is a policy choice. And it is a decision by corporations to exploit different environments so that they can prosper personally and that they can um, further uh, profit. And we saw this year um, that oil companies had record profits, um, profits that they hadn't seen uh, in their entire existence. And so, yeah, that, that is injustice. Um, and I also want to talk about climate change as uh, a system of repression. And in thinking about that through a justice lens, it's really a way that we're seeing uh, different systems of repression show up. Uh, it's uh, environmental racism, it's modern colonialism, examples of patriarchy in that um, women who are pregnant, um, women uh, across the world are being most impacted by heat waves, by uh, droughts, by different climate impacts. Um, and it's an issue of capitalism. And it's an, is a system that allows the exploitation of the environment for profit. Um, but specific to colonialism, we're seeing today um, that it isn't just um, the movement of people, but a reshaping of culture uh, that climate change is causing. So a case study example um, here in the US, uh, recently, uh, New Talk, Alaska, um, is a town um, that just received $25 billion in grant funding from the federal government uh, to support relocation uh, because of coastal erosion, uh, because of climate change. And, and that entire community who's resided there for who, who knows, I don't know how long, but so like hundreds of years, um, in New Talk, Alaska is now relocating. Um, and this is a community that did not contribute disproportionately to climate change, um, that is not using the same amount of energy as many of us uh, might be here. And um, that is modern colonialism because it is displacement of people and it is uh, a, a changing of culture. Uh, it is changing access to um, ceremony and to different kinds of uh, indigenous foods. And so in my work, um, we are thinking about all of these things and we think about climate solutions and bring this in not as an issue of uh, climate science, which it is, um, but really thinking about it in a way of understanding it as human impact uh, through, through society and culture. Uh, and so what that looks like is working with 
communities to discuss adaptation, uh, to discuss what they're looking for. And that's really uh, what happened with the situation with New Talk. Um, lots of organizers worked nationally uh, with that community. They worked with Patagonia to share their story um, and were able to get funding uh, that they asked for. Uh, and, and I think that climate justice is really about listening to communities on the front lines of the climate crisis. Um, and yeah, supporting how we can, writing to our government how we can. Um, and we'll get into a bit more about what people can do later. But um, yeah, for us, uh, solidarity is the most important thing. And how we show up in solidarity really is dependent on what that community might be looking for. Perfect. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Uh, so ultimately, the solutions that um, we can see both within and um, outside of these communities that are sitting on the front lines must be determined in collaboration with those communities, right? It's it's impossible to see solutions that are made from the outside and sort of um, placed upon people. So actually, that's where I want to turn next. Um, there are, of course, solutions like climate change adaptation that must happen in collaboration with frontline communities. Um, but the reality is that most of the carbon cutting ahead of us lies outside of areas that are most affected, whether they be impoverished areas in urban settings or indigenous communities um, in Alaska or in Louisiana. And the car the carbon cutting is actually in the hands of relatively few folks so most recent estimates indicate that a, the wealthiest 10 percent of people worldwide contribute about half of global carbon emissions um, and for anyone wondering the cutoff for being the wealthiest 10 percent is about 122,000 us dollars a year um, a famous statistic which counts carbon emissions at the factory instead of at the household traces two thirds of global greenhouse gas emissions to just 90 corporations. And that one has done the rounds for years. So some of you may have heard it before. So this is the challenge facing us, right? We're hearing about the challenges facing frontline communities. But as folks interested in addressing climate change at its root in carving, cutting carbon, um, I would like to hear about how your work grapples with the dramatic coupling of environmental degradation and global economic inequality. Uh, and what kind of ideas or efforts are you particularly excited about that bring the wealthiest individuals and the most influential corporations to the table? So we'll start with Zanaji with this one. Yeah, I love this question. And I think that it really puts into perspective uh, the role that such such a few uh, institutions play in causing climate change. And that's why when we talk about climate justice, um, we talk about it as a way to create system change uh, because it's about shaping institutions and institutional practices rather than focusing on individual solutions. So like when I first got started in environmental work, I was doing the beach cleanups. I was trying to reduce waste in my own life, but that didn't compare at all to like what the the electric grid was emitting or or what um you know vehicle companies only producing uh internal combustion engine vehicles was was doing for our environment so i think um yeah i i think that this is, is a huge reason why we need system change. And there have been policy solutions proposed on that. So if you're someone who is like interested in calling your elected officials, um, there's a few different bills that we're supporting that I would recommend uh, calling your official about. Uh, so I'll just do three um, and feel free to write these down as you go. But um, the first is the big oil windfall profits tax. Um, and so as I mentioned earlier, oil companies had their biggest profits um, in several decades this past year. And so the big oil windfall profits tax is really an effort to uh, curtail that huge windfall that they got from reopening post COVID. Um, and it's a tax that would put that money toward climate solutions. Um, so we're excited about supporting that. Um, there's also the End Polluter Welfare Act, uh, which would eliminate fossil fuel subsidies. Um, we're excited about that because um, 
essentially our tax dollars are continuing to subsidize the fossil fuel industry and to subsidize all of their activities, including um, drilling, including uh, facilities expansion, operations. Um, and for a transition to renewable energy to happen, to change that system of energy reliance, I think that we need to stop subsidizing an industry um, that, that is unlike any other because the fossil fuel industry receives more subsidies than any other industry and renewable energy uh, is not able to compete um, with the amount of subsidies that they have. Um, and the last one um, is related to the financial industry um, and that's the Fossil Fuel Finance Act, uh, Fossil Free Finance Act. Um, and that would encourage banks to implement emission reduction plans um, so that institutions uh, that, that lead investments that are asset managers are actually implementing plans to end their investment in fossil fuel expansion. Um, and so that uh, brings together all of these different uh, solutions uh, that will change corporations that have such a huge role in deciding what happens with climate change. So those are some thoughts from me. Terrific. Thank you. I love the common thread of you know, these are system change issues. These are intersecting challenges and we need big, uh, big ideas and big policies to change them. And, and thank you for recommending a few specific ones. Bella, tell us about how you think we can get people excited, bring the people with the most impact to the table, bring these corporations to the table to talk about climate change. Of course, yes. No, it's such an exciting thing. And this actually is really funny. I actually met Zanaji at an and Polluter for Welfare rally. And it's so funny to think like, oh, I was way back in high school. Like that was four years ago. That was like, I don't know, a fifth of my life ago. Like what, how, how that must have been so long. And then I forget how long these solutions take. So it's kind of fun kind of taking a step back and seeing the bigger picture of like, oh my God, these policies and these different legislations are still up for talks. And like, again, on that topic, like how do you get someone my age or someone who's going to be inheriting this earth so excited about it when they're kind of looking and like, oh, what am I going to do in the next two years? How am I going to go to college? How am I going to get a job? Um, so it's just like, how do you get people excited when they're like living on such a short timeline when a lot of these issues and things have to be solved in a long timeline? We're not going to be able to talk to all 90 of their companies, even if every single person decides to go outside and start picketing in front of Exxon or something and saying like, okay, like this will happen tomorrow. It really won't, which I think is one of the things that I always like to say, like, Bella, it takes time and understanding that it takes time. And it's a lot of those little efforts and those little chipping that you do like calling your local Senator, sending an email or showing up to the kind of these public speaker meetings for an hour of your day, an hour of your week. Um, it's a lot of those things that do make change that I really want to highlight even though they're not the most exciting and invigorating at times. But I guess talking about kind of like the work that I did and kind of what keeps me excited and what keeps me motivated is kind of looking at that long term. Um, one of the first things that I did coming into college was I was like, OK, like I'm going to come here. I'm going to study. But like, how can I do things on a larger scale? So I ended up getting into environmental consulting um, and seeing like, how can I use my position as a college student, as an soon to be young professional and get my voice in the room of a lot of these big companies. So one of the first projects that I ever did my freshman year was actually consulting for one of the largest auto manufacturers on their um, electric vehicle transition, which was super exciting for me. It was me and a group of like five other like college age students coming and showing presentations to people who worked in the auto industry for however many years and trying to invigorate them and saying, we've done the math, we've done the research, like this is the timeline that you guys have to be fully transitioned to electric vehicles. Um, and by the way, if you guys are interested in that number, it was somewhere between 2037 and 2040 where they would like have to completely transition, which to me, again, is crazy. Like that's longer than I've been alive, that kind of timeline. Um, but it's like, by the time it gets there and by the time I kind of see my work come to fruition, it's going to be something that's super huge and super exciting. So kind of getting into that room and getting talking to the people who make a difference again like calling your local legislators um, 
other things that I'm personally really excited about to see how it's going to unfold over the course of my life and the course of me seeing it from like creation to implementation is like, I'm sure you guys all have heard of the Infl Inflation Reduction Act. That's something I was super excited about and kind of seeing how that started to play with like how easy it is to buy an electric vehicle in California and kind of the infrastructure that's going on. Um, actually, funny enough, I don't know, Jake, if you were there, um, Vice President um, Harris was at the University of Michigan a little shy of a month ago. Um, and she spoke to us about climate change, which is super exciting. And we, we were hearing about kind of what they were doing and what that act was doing, particularly within Michigan, um, obviously for some Midwest pride. Um, Michigan is big when it comes to automobiles and manufacturing and a lot of the manufacturing that they were doing um, was shifting towards electric vehicles and towards battery manufacturing. And that was something that obviously I've been aware of and never really thought of, but her coming and saying like, this is directly how the Inflation Reduction Act is affecting the state you live in and what the cars are going to look like around you by the time you graduate, I thought was super duper cool. So things like that. Um, the EU actually started bringing up um, their own kind of version of the Green New Deal. Um, I don't know if you mentioned a little bit earlier, but the Green New Deal was an effort that I was supporting through the Sunrise Movement, originally bought by AOC. And Europe is doing something very similar, which I thought was super exciting, kind of seeing how that translates. Just fun fact, Europe is generally very ahead when it comes to climate change and kind of their efforts for cutting carbon. Um, so kind of seeing that and using that as a case study here in the US and seeing like, okay, what are they doing to do that? Um, I don't know if you guys are also familiar with like the Paris Agreement, but it's this agreement that we need to go carbon neutral essentially by 2050, preferably by 2030. Um, so seeing like, okay, how can we meet up with how they're dealing with the Paris Agreement? Because to be honest, they're also dealing with it better than we are. <laughs> Um, so kind of using a lot of, again, what's happening overseas, and I know we're talking about a lot of intersectionality, and then like, that's also why you guys are here today, to understand foreign policy, and that is what Indiana Council of World Affairs does, is understanding what's going on in other places of the world, and how can we bring that here to our amazing home front. So a lot of the things that are happening overseas, and kind of what they're doing, and what they're like, sort of climating and piloting is really exciting, and I can't wait to see that kind of translated over here. Another big thing for me, I'm super into innovation and startups. So 2022 slash 2023 specifically, there's been so much funding going to climate tech startups. So supporting a lot of the different science and different efforts that are going towards the new tech and the new innovation that's going to come in and be the people who cut all the different um, climate or carbon costs within companies. Is super exciting for me. So seeing the solutions they're creating and kind of the timelines they're on, obviously they're in a kind of venture capital slash startup, like seed funding stage, but getting to see where a lot of these companies are going after getting the seed funding and where they're going to take that innovation within the next 10 years and how they're going to use that to directly either suck carbon out of the atmosphere, go into companies and show them newer, better technologies and solutions to do what they're doing while still creating profits. Personally, is super exciting for me. So looking into kind of the climate tech space and climate tech startup space, I know Zanaji gave a little bit of some things. If you wanted to look into them, look into them. I would say definitely like looking into climate tech, how you could financially support that or how you could just even learn about what's going on because it's honestly really cool to read about and kind of see like, oh my God, that's a, that's a solution. I never thought of it before and I can't wait to see how this would happen. So I guess- as a big overarching idea, like different, not only bills, but different innovations and in tech and things that are happening um, is what personally keeps me really excited about climate change and ensuring that there's a future for all of us. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with that. I I feel like um, I should, since you mentioned uh, Vice President Harris's visit and, and in the context of transportation electrification, I think my boss would would find uh, would argue that I was remiss if I didn't mention that uh, our lab got a shout out during that talk as one of our um, our master's students recent papers focused on the intersection of cutting energy costs and um, reducing carbon emissions and basically trying to understand what parts of the country were the best suited for electrification on that front really exciting uh, work from from Jesse Vega um, and uh, I was really really cool to see Vice President Harris mentioned that. Um, okay, so 
all of this is great. I, I love hearing about some of the things that people are really excited for, whether it's policy or innovation. Um, obviously, electrification of vehicles is a big headline catcher now. And I think that those sorts of innovations that you're talking about, Bella, are going to continue to evolve in the headlines, right? We're going to see how these different sorts of day-to-day -day interventions change over the course of the next 20 years. We have about 10 minutes before we're going to transition to public questions. Um, and I'm hoping that we can spend that time talking a little bit about your current work and the things that you're the most excited about um, in terms of getting people to the table. So none of the things that we have talked about today can really work. None of these policies, none of these innovations can work without broadening the base for climate action, bringing more people into the proverbial room. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out that the Yale Center for Climate Change Communication and the famous sci climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe, who if you haven't followed her on Twitter and gone to some of her talks, you should. She's great. Um, both point out that only about 9% of Americans are act actually actively dismissive of climate change. More than 90% of Americans mostly accept the science or are actually actively concerned about it. Um, and the biggest challenge of climate action is really not getting those 9% of people on board, because frankly, we're not going to and we don't need them. The other 91% of people need to unite around some actions and some policies that can we, we can really start to work towards to drive action. So my question for you, and I'm going to talk a little bit more, but my general question is, how do we do that? I think it's um, maybe worth sharing. I'm going to send a link in the chat. Um, Patagonia recently ran an ad that I think is pretty interesting. It reads four words, um, basically, that climate change is both catastrophic and inevitable. Um, the writer of the article that we read for this week pointed out that actually the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has toned down a lot of its messaging because they have found that sort of inevitable catastrophic messaging to be really ineffective to get people um, to, to have a negative effect and harm efforts on raising awareness. In Patagonia's ad, when you reach the bottom, it tells you to read backwards um, and take over, take, take the opposite approach. And basically what it says is we have both urgency demanded of us, but also there are a lot of effective solutions and we can visualize change. Um, thought of more broadly, this raises the question that I'm going to pose to you all to close the day. So what are the most effective strategies for galvanizing action? What new ideas or efforts are you most excited about that broaden the base for climate change solutions? Um, and really in your mind and kind of in what is, you know, in your hearts today, what is inspiring folks? What is inspiring you to take action on this challenge that will define the 21st century? So I'm going to ask Bella to tackle that first, and then we'll close with Sanashi. Yeah, so I think, and it's very important to mention what Jake mentioned, like some of the language and some of the things people use sometimes can kind of shy people away from climate action. I remember when I was working with California Youth versus Big Oil, we worked hand in hand with a group called Youth versus Apocalypse. And I remember when I initially started out, I was like, Youth versus Apocalypse, like, I know climate change was bad, but like the apocalypse, that sounds so scary. Like, that sounded a little too brash for me. And it was something I couldn't get my brain around again because I was like looking five, 10 years into the future, I couldn't see something that was totally dystopian and apocalyptic. So understanding even like that initial messaging and that initial like piece of like, okay, what's going to make climate change accessible and climate change action specifically accessible. And I think it's incorporating a lot of that humanity level. Um, something like you guys being here and listening to us speak today, I think is an amazing first step in understanding what is important, what do people care about and kind of how it's affecting people personally and empathetically as opposed to like a lot of the numbers. Like I know we're bombarded with statistics every day about how terrible the world and how terrible everything else is. And I know sometimes, even though those statistics are heavy, they can go over my head. At the end of the day, sometimes it just feels like numbers and it just feels like, how am I seeing this come to fruition? How am I feeling this? Like I can know that 90% of people are affected by climate change, but do I come across 90% of people and speak about it and experience it in my day-to-day -day life? Maybe not. It's not something that's as 
like apparent to the eye. And I think it's those things that's apparent to the eye and the ear and the heart and the soul that really empowers people and gets them moving long-term as opposed to a scary statistic or some sort of really galvanizing talk that they hear. Um, so I guess like in terms of what I believe are the most effective strategies and kind of what empowers people, like listen to the people that these problems are affecting, listen to what climate scientists are really trying to tell you, like read the articles, like again, subscribe to the great decisions and read what they're telling you and kind of understand from more of a base level than someone saying like, oh, this is a problem, like we need to solve it. Like really understanding how on a human level and how on a family level and how on a community level, this affects the people around you was something that was like super special for me. Like, again, like I think we were, all, as we all mentioned, like we all started based off of what we saw. We saw plastic pollution, we saw water bottles in the ocean and that is what invigorated us to do it. And not always are we going to go out and see exactly what we're searching for, but if we make the effort to go out and listen to people and be open-minded and go to talks and go to forums and really understand the issue and understanding how people tackle that as opposed to like, again, like just hearing things and just kind of saying, I don't know where to start. Like something like Zanaji mentioning, like, here's a place to start. Here's X, Y, and Z bills that you can support or speaking again to like, a youth or someone in the space being like, how can I help? I think it's a lot more of a one-on-one -on -one or community connection when it comes to this support and how we're going to effectively tackle the support. Like uniting that 90 per, I guess 91% of people who do believe in climate change and think it's an issue isn't, is like Jake said, isn't going to be the problem. It's not getting that extra 9%. It's about how do we get that 91% to understand that we're in a community of 91% and we all have the power to act on it and to do things. And I think, like I said, it's about listening to those stories and understanding who's in your boat and kind of taking action together and maybe even like starting foundations like Zero Hour. Like Zanaji did. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have any other thoughts, Anaji. That was really great. Um, I guess, I mean, I'll just add, um, yeah, that was really good. Um, I think that um, a huge part about what how I'm thinking about how we bring uh, all these people together and also congratulations on being in the 91% everyone, really appreciate that, um, is, is understanding like where we can leverage uh, action and where we have power. And, and also understanding who has power to make decisions at the institutional level. And so um, corporations have responsibilities over their supply chains, over where they're doing business, over their operational emissions. Our government has power over the electric grid, over uh, where we're sourcing our energy, where we're exporting it, all of these things. So whatever issue you choose that you wanna get involved in, um, understanding who, is actually responsible for changing that and, and being that voice that lets them know that you want it changed, uh, I think is a huge thing. Um, and uh, Bella also mentioned empathy. And I think that the climate movement is a movement about empathy. And for so long, um, there has been a narrative about um, like climate doom. And we still see this in the news. Um, and just headlines, like I saw an article recently that talked about the polar vortex collapsing. Um, and if you just read the headline and if you didn't study, like I, I studied Arctic climate science. And so I, I knew like what it, they were talking about in the article, but if you would just um, read the headline, you would think like, oh my gosh, like the Arctic is about to collapse, which is not the case. <laughs> but uh, I think that, um, my, my first thought when I read that was about Texas, um, which, which is something that you would not necessarily couple together. But I remembered um, what happened the last time there was a fluctuation in the polar vortex and there was the freeze in Texas. And, and that impacted so many people, people lost power, um, there were casualties. And I think that by telling stories uh, about climate, about people impacted by pollution, about people impacted by climate disasters, 
that is how we spur empathy. And so that drives action. And, and that's why we have people calling in uh, so that Texas's electricity grid gets in, uh, integrated with the rest of the country. And that's why we have people calling in to stop pipelines. Um, because even though we are living uh, in place, I grew up on the coast of Connecticut, like we did not have a coal plant or a natural gas facility or anything like that near me. Uh, but I saw that uh, in other places. And, and I decided that because I had the privilege to not live there, that no one should be impacted by that. Uh, and no one should have to experience that injustice because there are so many people who are able to not experience injustice. Um, and so I think we have to lead with empathy. We have to bring people in. Uh, and so much of that right now is honestly digital. Um, and so there are opportunities to get involved wherever you are. Um, if you wanna support actions in Alaska, like you can do that from wherever you are. And actually speaking of, I'll just put a link in the chat on this because uh, we're working on an issue in Alaska right now. It's called the Conoco Phillips Willow Project. Um, it's a project uh, that is being proposed by Conoco Phillips for drilling in Alaska. And it would uh, set us on track to miss our climate goals. It would be one of the biggest projects ever uh, created. And I'll just put this link in the chat for you all if you would like to write a letter to the Biden administration uh, on that. If you're watching the recording, you can go to peoplevsfossilfuels.org and support there. Um, but I think that this work is really about understanding that yes, we want to take some action, we want to change institutions, but we also as individuals have a huge say in that and every individual voice matters. You have the power to convince someone uh, and we can all convince someone in our lives to get more involved. And that's how movements are built. And that's how the 91% uh, wins. So thanks. And that's how the 91% wins. That is a terrific way to close. I wanna thank you both uh, for those really interesting thoughts, ideas, um, definitely some quotes that I've taken away from this that will stick with me. Um, I hope everyone else enjoyed it as much as I have. And I really do wanna thank you both again for giving me the opportunity to get to know you, to talk with you and hear your ideas because they are truly inspirational. Um, I'm excited that we get to hear more of it based on folks' questions. So I will sit back at this point and hand things over to Ray who will host the public Q&A. Ray, it's all yours. All right, thanks, Jake. And uh, I really appreciate everybody's comments tonight. This was a really a stimulating presentation. Um, if you would like to ask a question, uh, you can direct them to me. And what I will do is I will check the chat and I will either read your question or if you prefer, uh, you can ask your own question out loud. And actually, that's our preferred model here since we'd like to engage our uh, our audience in the, in the conversation. But uh, while you're thinking about this and maybe writing a couple of questions, I have about six I wrote down here myself. So I'll just, I won't monopolize things here. But um, so I'm uh, actually a, a retired business professor. So I'm kind of sympathetic to corporations. So I, I want to uh, kind of... Uh, Address a quick, I read an article today in the New York Times about a building in New York City, a 75-story um, office building that was just built, and they built it to be net zero in construction. However, when they so this design, of course, dates back probably 10 years when they started building this building, and they put gas burners in there, and now all of a sudden New York City is banning gas, and all of a sudden this organization that invested billion a billion dollars in this construction of this monumental building uh, is now finding itself at odds with the city of New York because of uh, a decision they made a long time ago before New York made the decision. So I guess my question is, does you know this sort of moving target from environmentalism cause businesses to be reluctant to kind of engage in real active kind of uh, addressing some of these environmental issues? And I'll throw that open to any three of the, any of you three there, if you want to answer that. Yeah, I can just share a first thought on it. I think that um, this really raises the issue of uh, just transition 
And so we talked about this idea of a just transition a lot in terms of environmental and climate justice. And a just transition is essentially one that doesn't leave people behind when we transition to renewable energy or, or we pursue sustainability goals. And what that means is that, uh, for example, for workers who are in the fossil fuel industry, um, committing to guaranteed job training programs for transition to renewable energy or another sustainable field. Um, and it could look like, for your example, um, committing funding to replace uh, gas infrastructure with electric. Uh, because there are decisions that have been locked in for many years now based on existing knowledge that um, is now outdated. And we are constantly operating on new information and new guidelines. And because it's taken so long um, for uh, national, state, and municipal governments to take action on climate change, a lot of people are deciding on the fly what uh, they can do around sustainability. So I think that a just transition really would incorporate solutions that allow businesses to adapt um, in a way that doesn't uh, mean that they have to close their project. I mean, that project sounds like it was probably a multi-million dollar project. And to think that um, it might not happen, people would not have housing opportunity because of that decision uh, is something that the environmental movement doesn't want because it alienates people. And so we want um, a movement that is inclusive, um, that is, um, fighting for emissions reductions while also uh, continuing business, continuing people's livelihoods. Uh, thank you. Anybody else got a thought on that? I can just hop in. I just wanted to like highlight that mention of just transition that Zanaji talked about. Um, some of the work that I did over the summer was trying to reduce some of the carbon emissions in large companies. And they're like, again, we spent so many dollars last year trying to get this electric fleet and turns out that there's not enough infrastructure right now to support it going across the country because as of right now a lot of this charging these charging stations don't exist where we need them to um and I think it's about that just transition again in tandem with legislation and a lot of the things that they're trying to do of building out that infrastructure but also understanding like these are long-term investments like it's not going to be the easiest in terms of transition but in terms of like how long-term things work, I think it's really important to kind of see the overall lifetime value of kind of businesses and what they're putting towards and kind of how that impact on environment and on efficiency is going to happen over time, I think is something really important when we're talking about like how this transition is going to work, even when the first few years might be very shaky. Okay, thank you. Uh, Claire Collins, you, you had a question you want to ask it? Yeah, um, let's see. I've, I've always been interested in the movement of water. I think that's a, a natural resource that, um, you know, needs more looking into. Um, I, I don't see why we can't uh, invest in piping water from flood prone areas like a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico. Why can't we have underground pipes that would take that water someplace like California where there was a drought? Um, I'm thinking maybe evaporation or, or maybe that um, there's so many chemical uh, places in, you know, like Texas and Louisiana, where there would be polluted water, and we don't need that. But um, I, I just wonder, has anyone ever looked into that? Because they, they've got these underground pipes where natural gas and oil crosses the continent and goes through mountains and everything. We've got to get the gas and the oil moved. But, you know, why can't we do that with water? I have thought on that too. Um, and feel free to jump in others too. But um, yeah, so I think that, um, well, there's a few things there. Cause one, so uh, in Salt Lake City uh, in Utah, we have 
drought. Um, and also we experience intense flooding when it does rain. And so there's this huge uh, flooding. Um, and then like there's issues with porosity with the soil because uh, it's not retaining water because it's been so dry. Um, and so how do we solve that? How do we solve uh, a water crisis in places that are experiencing climate change and that are having drought? And I think that um, a huge part of it is rethinking city design um, and rethinking uh, like expansion of, of cities into the future. But for Salt Lake City, um, that could look like introducing more native plants. Um, that could look like more green space because a lot of issues with water is actually that it's just not being retained um, where water is falling. Uh, there's flood waters and the, the flood just it goes into these overflow tanks um, in the city and it's disposed of and it's not put to, put to good use. So I think in specific cities, um, rather than piping water from elsewhere, uh, the first, the biggest impact that we could have uh, at the locations where we are is to actually um, affect change at like the city level to increase green space um, and increase water retention in the places that, that we have it. And it's also a uh, issue of like diversion of water uh, for different issues like agriculture. Um, so the kinds of foods that we're growing, um, the kinds of uh, livestock that we are, are producing uh, require various amounts of water. Uh, and where we decide to grow those matters. And Utah has a huge farming population and has an intense water supply that's diverting water from um, the Wasatch Mountain Range, which feeds um, the water supply of Salt Lake City and the Salt Lake Valley. Um, and it's diverting that water for other uses that are not for people. Um, and so really thinking about how we, we use water in drought prone places, um, is something that we should think a lot more about. But I would definitely look into local groups that are working on that because there's tons of city solutions that we have. Thanks. Anybody else got a thought on that, uh, Bella or Jake? I'm. I'll be honest with you. It's it's dangerous to ask a guy who studies water and climate change adaptation to talk about it. Um, but I, I would be happy to hear Bella if you have anything to say as a native Californian. I'd be happy to hear it. Oh, I was going to turn it back to you in terms of like general infrastructure statewide. I think again, like as someone from California, I know the drought exists. I know why it exists. And again, like Zanaji said, it's a lot about that water retention, but using kind of cross state platforms and different infrastructure to be able to do that. I wish I could tell you about it. That sounds like an amazing idea. Yeah, so this is uh, actually an issue that's really close to my heart. And I will um, say that some of the most inspirational civil engineering projects of the 20th century were actually really committed to this idea that you're you're proposing. So the um, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power has a long history of working with communities and also in uh, contention with some communities to acquire permits to use water from other places. Um, and there are a variety of valleys on the far side of the Sierras that actually supply water to Southern California as a result of some of the really extraordinary aqueduct projects that took place in the 20th century. Um, and so there, there really is a, a lot of work that has gone into how we move water to where it needs to be used for cities and for agriculture, among other things. The Central Arizona project comes to mind. Um, and then, of course, the Los Angeles Aqueduct. All of that said, what I think is really interesting about the modern sort of incarnation of um, water projects is that the sort of era of great dam building and the era of, you know, mass, massive infrastructure is in many ways behind us. And, and that's not necessarily because it's always not a good solution, but actually, um, it has become extremely difficult to build things like that, both as a result of lack of good places to do it and as a result of increasing regulatory load that governs those sorts of massive projects. Um, and so I think Zanaji is absolutely right that the sort of place-based 
sort of green infrastructure projects are certainly a place to look. One of the things that California recently rolled out is a project that is actually based on the, the work that I did, not, not, not inspired by my work at all, but the project that I did my master's work on, um, which was the state of Idaho unveiling an extensive groundwater recharge program that basically was intended to um, rethink how water balance was was working in the state of Idaho. And they said, okay, so what we're going to have to do is start recharging the aquifer intentionally. We're going to start dumping water into the ground to recharge the aquifer. And one of the things that California has done in response to this flood is say, okay, we already had plans to start doing that, to start recharging the aquifer, but we're going to start giving irrigation districts like the Merced Irrigation District early permits to do that, do that now, to go ahead and start diverting water from these flooding creeks and, and recharging the aquifer through people's farmlands. So I think there are a lot of really exciting projects going on. I think some of them are local, some of them are urban, some of them are green infrastructure, some of them are bigger, right? Some of them are, are groundwater recharge on the state and national scale. Um, and I'm excited to see where that goes. Um, pipelines have certainly been proposed from you know, the, the Pacific Northwest, from Vancouver especially was a, a subject of conversation going all the way down to California. Um, and they have, I think at this point, I, I expect the era of grand water projects to be largely behind us. Um, and whether that's a good thing or not, I'll let you all decide. But that is kind of my take on, on um, some of the solutions that I see in front of us. All right, thank you. Um, kind of maybe shift gears a little bit to more local thinking in the Midwest here. <clears throat> Climate issues in the Midwest seem to be relatively minor. We have plenty of water. Our temperature hasn't changed that much. I mean, our summers are a little hotter, but we don't have those scorching days like they've had in California and, and down south. And our winters are, most people appreciate the relatively mild winters we've been having. So how do we motivate you know, people in like Illinois, Chicago, or Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, to care about this. I mean, what is what's? I mean, it's not as salient to us as it is in some of these coastal areas. Sorry, just to clarify, when you say care about this, like care about water and droughts, and or just care about what as a greater greater. Well, I, I don't think they see that as California's problem. <laughs> They see that as New Orleans' problem. Flooding in Texas is Texas's problem. We don't, those aren't issues for us. I mean. Yeah, I think or at least again, being a Midwest transplant right now, originally from California, a lot of the things I'm seeing is like you mentioned, kind of with like the easier winters, kind of just like echoing a different situation that we have. So at least California, what was what I was seeing every day and what was on my forefront was the water, was clean waters, was X, Y, and Z, it was the impending earthquakes. And then here in Michigan, I see, okay, we're having a relatively warm winter right now. Like it's great for me, but like, why is that? What is the greater meaning on what this does? Actually, with some of my research that I did um, in the lab, um, it was kind of seeing how climate change and the melting of some of the ice that we had in Lake Michigan was affecting the algal community and how that algal community change was affecting the overall biodiversity of Lake Michigan and how that was causing these kind of chain ball effects. So like, again, we're not really looking at the lake every day and seeing like, oh, okay, like the ice caps are melting, but we're seeing in, or at least in my new Midwest day-to-day -day life, like today's 50 degrees in the middle of February. Like that is pretty uncommon. Um, what does this mean in greater issues? And like, once you read the research and look at the research, you're like, whoa, climate change is affecting me in a way that's different and maybe not as apparent to the eye as it is when you're having floods and having different things. So maybe you're not getting a snowstorm on, or at least this was like the first time this year that it didn't snow on Halloween. So maybe you're not getting snow on Halloween, which like is great for you. But if you take a step back and you kind of look at the research and look at what's going on that's a little bit more invisible. You see like, we're getting the same issues, like plants and animals are dying off. The overall change in temperature is great. Like we love that, like that's awesome. But when you realize kind of the effects that it's having on 
the water levels and on the community and the climate. It's something to really be concerned about as opposed to like kind of these bigger headlines happening in other states. Yeah, I have a quick addition to that too, actually, um, and appreciate that response. I think that this also shows um, the different ways in which we have to communicate with different constituencies around climate and around movement building, because um, there are so many people who I know that just don't care about climate change, um, but do care generally about environmental issues. And like, even though the risk perception about climate change isn't present for them, they do see risk in fossil fuel projects, for example. And some of the biggest fights that we've had this year are actually in the Midwest. Um, so a company called Enbridge um, is uh, doing expansion on uh, the line three and the line five pipelines. Um, so line three, um, is is this huge uh, project. It's transporting tar sands, uh, fossil fuels to uh, Alberta and Canada. Um, and line five as well, also uh, transporting fossil fuels across the Great Lakes. Um, so line five actually runs below uh, Lake Michigan um, and Lake Huron. Um, and there is risk for wetlands, there's risk for the Great Lakes. And so even though um, there isn't that direct climate impact, there is this environmental impact of like relating fossil fuels um, to environmental damage, but also at the end of that pipeline, um, those fossil fuels will be burned. And so those are like two uh, related, like, yes, it's not climate change, but it, it is so related. Um, and so I think that, uh, yeah, get, getting involved wherever you are, there is somehow, I think, a connection to environmental issues. Yeah, those are really good points. I'm, I'm not going to um, speak long because I, I don't think that I really need to add much. I will say, and this is my opportunity to plug the boilers, um, Purdue Center for Climate Change Research actually spearheaded in uh, a recent climate change assessment specific to the state of Indiana that really highlighted some of the things that um, both Sanaji and Bella are talking about with changing weather patterns with the risk of new uh, fossil fuel infrastructure, but also just thinking more broadly um, about the issues facing the state. And, and I think that, you know, the one that comes to mind for me as somebody who's interested in food systems is, of course, the change in agriculture, but they, they separated into a variety of categories related to health, forests, urban green space, agriculture, aquatic ecosystems, et cetera, et cetera. So I am going to send that link, and I would strongly encourage anyone interested in what climate change looks like in Indiana to check it out. It's a really nice report, very accessible uh, and worth a read. All right, thank you. Uh, Charlie, are you ready to kind of comment here now? Charlie Boswell? Yeah, I, my tech skills are, are pretty dreadful. I'm looking at an email from a friend of mine who's a legislative expert about pieces of legislation that have been uh, brought to our state legislature. And they're sitting in committees and they're not getting hearings because the chairman doesn't give a, a whatever for it. Um, I can give you four house bills that are being sat on in the Environmental Affairs Committee with Alan Morrison, Representative um, District 42, uh, doesn't want to give them a hearing. Um, how do we get uh, people? And if, if they're not heard by February 16th, they're not gonna be heard this session. So how do we get people to uh, pay attention and, and start getting on the phone, getting on emails, contacting this guy, contacting their reps and asking them to please support these things. There's also some pretty bad legislation that is getting hearings and we need to also comment on those as well, but um, it'd be helpful if we had some easy way to uh, to do that. And unfortunately, I'm not sophisticated enough to be able to tell you how to do that. Do you want the numbers of the bills? 
Okay. You're, you're, you know what, uh, Charlie, you, you sent those to me. Uh, we're going to send out an email tomorrow. Okay. Good. Have some issues from tonight's meeting, and we'll good. include those in that email tomorrow. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, so, you know, one of the organizations in Indiana is the Hoosier Environmental Council. Uh, Jake, did you work with them when you were at Purdue? Yeah, a little bit. Yep. Great group. And, and I know they pay a lot of attention to uh, legislation in the state. And uh, so that, uh, Charlie, that might be one group that you could hook up with, Hoosier Environmental Council. Yep. Uh, my, my personal angst to grind with the state is I'm one of those people who has an electric car. There, there is not a charging station between Indianapolis and Lansing, Michigan. So that's 250 miles, which is in the winter time is just the outside of the range of my car. So uh, I think Indiana is, is really far behind in developing its its uh, charging infrastructure for electric vehicles. And, you know, I, Charlie, you know, your bills sitting in state legislature, you, it just kind of drives me crazy that we're not doing the kinds of things we should be doing there. But anyhow, sorry, I'm, that's my own personal X to grind there. Um, Ray, I, I agree with you. I want to make one quick point, um, and this is perhaps outside the scope of environmental activism, but I've spent a little time working with um, voters, not politicians in the state of Michigan, and they have been largely responsible for passing a statewide referendum that ended gerrymandering in Michigan. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things you're highlighting, Charlie, is that actually there is a much larger constituency of climate aware voters in Indiana than there are representatives in the state house. Um, and unfortunately, gerrymandering has made it really hard to get uh, climate legislation passed in conservative states, even when there are people who are interested and excited about that issue. So I would argue that actually this is another of our intersecting challenges, where if we can restore some of the democratic power that people have in their vote, it also restores some of our opportunities for climate change, activism, and action. All right, thank you. Uh, Bowden, you got a question, like a comment you'd like to make? And unmute yourself. Uh, yes, I unmuted myself. Uh, yes, so uh, I actually lived in New York City uh, during Sandy. And uh, I, I also lived in New York City during 9-11 in lower Manhattan. And I can tell you that I found uh, Sandy much more frightening. So I've educated myself and I've actually, I'm forming, uh, we have an opportunity in the United States to develop a global brain trust to address climate change. In fact, Samantha Power in 2020, when President Biden got elected president, she said, we have the capacity to educate uh, people from all over the world, no matter what the problem. Amazingly enough, she didn't mention climate, she didn't mention climate change, but she mentioned the fact that historically, if you look at black leadership in Africa, for instance, it, 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 it is heavily educated in the United States. So in 2019, I actually, I, I was very moved by Greta Thunberg because as I was educating myself after Sandy, I kind of anticipated Greta Thunberg for a variety of reasons. We have the capacity to uh, work with the United Nations to create a global brain trust. And I'll give you an example of how big the problem is. I, I read that someplace, that there are going to be 100 million refugees coming into Europe from Pakistan, you know, the Middle East, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And there was a talk at Duke uh, for, by a migration expert from the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank, I can't remember now. And I asked him this question, you know, be, you know before or after the talk, and he said, 100 million. He says, that's just the, that's just the start. That's 100 million from Bangladesh. So, so we have to think of this in a global sense. New York City, which has the United Nations, is creating a climate solution center. And this is an opportunity to mobilize this effort. If we take 20 of our top universities in the country, right? And usually these are private universities, not in all cases. They offer $250 million worth of international scholarships per year. So that includes, 
that amounts to a, a, an undergraduate campus of 40,000, uh, 4,000 students, I'm sorry, at any one time. If we capture in our program 50 of those scholarships, and I have, I have 30 years experience doing this, within 10 years, you'll have 500 people from all over the world who can work with the United Nations because most of these colleges are in the Northeast. And if you look at Indiana, because obviously this is a kind of a regional program, you've got Notre Dame is one of those universities. It offers a lot of international scholarships. If you look at Indiana University, it has an online high school. And that transfer of knowledge to address all those local problems, we have the expertise but we're at the margin, we're gonna be at the margins of the climate change. You know, people will move to Duluth or something, you know, but it's not, you know, it's not going to existentially threaten our country, you know? I mean, it's not, I mean, there'll be, you know, so, so we have to think of this as a global issue. Yeah. And there are all sorts of things we can do. And, I, and I'm just here to share that. It's, our program is called Shape the Sciences. And I have several beachheads that will relate to these issues. Yeah. I personally, you know. So, well, you know. I, I, that brings up a good question uh, that maybe we're going to ask Jake to address a little bit, or maybe one of the other panelists. You know, to what extent is the US government investing in R&D in, in environmental science? Are we doing enough? Is there, uh, you know, this is, you know, we spend a lot of money on defense research and development. We spend a lot of money on a lot of other things. You know, Can I comment on that? Can, I just want to say that we do a tremendous amount of study on this, but I have talked to people in the Pacific Islands and we don't share that knowledge with them. If you have all those islands in the Pacific, which are, you know, oceans generate a tremendous part of our oxygen. And those islands, nations are natural stewards of that of those oceans because they live on those we don't share that expertise it's not a question of how much we generate it's also a question whether we share it the same thing is true of vaccine right yeah i would actually jump in there and say that um so i studied climate science at brown um in rhode island which has um a leading institute on environment and society and what i found uh, when I was studying there as someone who had started a climate organization in high school uh, and was leading climate solutions um, through movement building and activism, that uh, academic institutions have a huge silo on the amount of information um, that is shared with movements. Uh, and I think that one of the, the bridges that we're trying to build is between the climate movement and institutions of higher education because there is knowledge about the history of movement building, about tactics for mobilization, um, climate science communication, um, and climate education is not something that's widely available. My first course that was dedicated to environmental studies was my first year of college. Um, and so accessing that information um, at all ages uh, and in all places around the world is, is something that's super important. Uh, Totally agree. And also I'll just uh, shout out to a group uh, called Climate Cardinals. Um, and uh, if you haven't heard of them, uh, they do translation of scientific texts uh, and they've translated the IPCC reports uh, into dozens of different languages um, to disperse that around the world. But uh, yeah, I think that climate education is a core part of climate solutions. Mm. I have one, unless somebody else has another comment on that, I have one final question, and then we'll turn it over to Betty and kind of take us home tonight. But uh, do you think the environmental movement is too fragmented? We've heard a lot of discussion here tonight about different groups doing different things. Uh, would it be more effective if we identified the two or three biggest issues and everybody focused on those rather than 30 issues that we all you know, everybody's got their own little personal group that they're interested in this, they're interested in that and so forth. So, you know, in, in one sense, we, we get so fragmented and it, so many efforts on what I might call small things that the big things don't get the attention they should.
That's a great question. I think that um, at least the way I think about it is that so much of um, mm. so much of the climate movement is organizing around very place-based issues um, that are very local. And, and often the people that are leading that mobilization are being impacted by those issues. And so a difficulty in thinking about, and this has honestly been a difficulty since the first Earth Day, um, where people came to Earth Day to really rally around this one day of action. Um, but since then, there have been different movements. There's been the plastics movement, toxics, uh, people working on fossil fuels, people working on conservation. And there are so many different splinters of the climate movement where people have interest, uh, whether because they have connection to that place, uh, just vested interest in the issue. Um, and so coalescing all of those groups um, is so difficult because they have their own priorities on what they think is the most important for where they call home. Um, but I do think that there are opportunities for national action that are being missed because of uh, the different silos that we have as environmental organizations. So for example, um, like uh, we've partnered a lot with Sierra Club on different issues and, and they're not on every issue that uh, another organization like um, the National Resources Defense Council and our DC might be on. Um, and how do we get all of those people all in the same room um, to fight for one thing at once? Um, it's a really difficult question. And I don't know if I actually have an answer for it, but I do think that um, coalitions of people working all together on, on one specific target um, is going to be really key to solving the climate crisis. And that link that I put in the chat earlier from people versus fossil fuels, is actually an example of how we're improving that. Um, and the People Versus Fossil Fuels Coalition is a group of lots of national organizations, of local organizers, indigenous nations, all coming together to call on President Biden to work on a comprehensive set of executive actions on climate. Um, so it's a long-winded way of saying, we gotta work together more and, and we totally have to uh, fight for all the same solutions together. All right, thank you. Jake or Bill, you got any thought on that? I would just echo, I think, again, like it's about coming together and there's a lot of these local issues that will get people excited and get people involved because again, like just connecting on other things I've talked about, it's what you see and it's what you hear and it's what you feel that really empowers you. But again, like if that little issue is going to be the impetus of a lot of change, then obviously like keep focusing on the little things get the little wins, like the little wins are what builds into big wins and builds into a lot of these long-term solutions and this long-term activism and excitement that happens. So yeah, I'm such a supporter of the little guy of the beach cleanups, even though, as we talked about, I know sometimes it doesn't make as big of a change just going straight to the polls or going straight to a different office. Yeah, that's a really good point. I will, um, I think just offer maybe one last reference to one of the really fabulous writers who has talked a lot about um, climate change and climate change activism and the issues that we face. And that's Bill McKibben, uh, who founded 350.org, among other groups, and has been identified among the leaders of the climate movement globally. Um, and in, a, in some of his writing in 2019, he reflected on that title and said, you know, I actually, I don't think I am a leader of the climate movement. And in fact, I would argue that the climate movement doesn't have a leader. And he pointed to some of the great movements in history, like the civil rights movement that have really, truly, in many ways, not had a central leader. They had central figures, right? Martin Luther King, of course, Malcolm X, among others, played a central role, but they were not a leader in the sense that they were not dictating action and they were not dictating ideology. Um, and by McKibben's reckoning, those are the movements that really make change. And he argued that the climate movement is another one of those great leaderless movements that's gonna change society and change the way we think about our interactions with the environment. And I think the quote that always stays with me that I'll leave you with is that he said that by the very nature of having a leaderless movement, you must therefore have a leader full movement and everyone who gets involved becomes a leader. So I guess that would be what I call on everyone to do is to get involved and by doing so become 
a leader in the climate movement. All right. Well, thank you, panelists, for your uh, input tonight. And I'll turn it back over to Betty. Oh, thank you. You can see why uh, I was really excited about to have this um, this particular panel of, of uh, youth activists. I mean, I almost hate to say that word because it sounds like, you know, the boys and girls, the students, you know, these are really powerful people, really powerful people already who have proven themselves. And so thank you so much. Um, I remain inspired. I think it's outstanding. You know, Ray, I had to laugh when I heard you ask that question because I remember years ago when I was uh, uh, still involved in the nonprofit industry and somebody making a comment, I think it was somebody who was perhaps on my board from the corporate world say, no, uh, she was using the reference, I think of perhaps shelters or something. It could have been food banks. It could have been a number of nonprofit initiatives. There's just so many of you. Couldn't you just sort of like consolidate and rather than having all these executive directors and all these just consolidate. And I, I said, well, as long as every bed is filled, there is the need. You know, and as long as people are showing up to pick up the beach, yeah, there's the need. So I would really hesitate to, I'm so glad that, that our panelists pointed out, you know, don't discourage the effort, encourage. And and I my fear would be if, if you said, well, we have these two or three issues and the person who thinks, well, my small one doesn't matter. And and uh, so, yeah, great, great response. Thank you very, very much. As always, I always hate to leave um, a topic we have just spent, you know, 90 minutes on, and particularly when they're in there with great intensity and it's so interesting that we have to say, moving along, come and join us again, but I have to do that. Um, you know, this year, Great Decisions is doing every two weeks instead of every week. It's a little less hectic. So please come back and join us again in two weeks. We are going to be discussing Iran, and we'll have a very popular presenter, Pierre Atlas. Many of you know him, and that'll be the evening of um, February the 28th. Um, Iran, the Gulf states, Iran status in the world. It might, might sound like, oh gosh, Iran again, but Pierre will have a very interesting twist to it. How However, what's very important is that you come back and join us two nights from now. Uh, we are going to be, we will have Ambassador Matilda Macandabanda, uh, Macandabana. Oh, I can't. <laughs> we have worked on her name before the program, but here I am. Um, Mukandabana, that's it. And she is going to be talking about that evolving relationship that we have with Africa. We've had it for a very long time, for decades, through USAID. And of course, now we've had the discussion of China and the Spelts and Road Initiative. And is there a room still for uh, USAID, for the State Department? What is our evolving relationship with Africa? And she is going to share that with us. 52 countries make it up an, an extremely diverse area of the world. Uh, so it's pretty hard to kind of talk about Africa in a very general sense. But hopefully I should be able to break that down and point out some areas that are extremely uh, significant. I, I think that is it. Um, just please do join us. Uh, it would be great to have you back. It would be great to have you back in two weeks. And again, I want to say thank you very much to, to, uh, to Jake. You did a fantastic job, Jake. Thank you very much. A wonderful to see you again, Zanaji. Thank you very much. And to Bella. Again, I'm sorry that Serena could not join us. Uh, when she sees the recording, she's going to feel the same. But it was a great discussion. I am inspired and I am full of hope. Full of hope, as I'm sure you all are as well. And don't you agree? Let's just get out of the way. <laughs> you guys are ready to take over. And thank you, Ray. As always, you did a marvelous job. Thank you. And thank you, Amy, to our host who took good care of us this evening. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.